If you want a little wisdom for the day, you want a little encouragement, you've been thinking about that, just do it. Just do it because it's not worth it. And I, I'm going to have to take my advice. Hey, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Richard and uh, I am a follower of Christ. I'm a husband and a father, and I also pastor a Baptist church here in Kentucky. Uh, we're going to be talking about top 10 books today you could or should or would want to read in 2023. Coming up next. Cheers. Coffee. I love coffee. Although this is a latte, usually I drink it black. Latte is just with milk. It's not super fancy, really. Uh, we're going to be talking about books today. I did one earlier last year. I did a book review, well, not really review, really suggestion, I guess you could say. Uh, before we get there, though, we had a uh, tornado warning. Warning? Yes. Tornado watch is like, yeah, we think there might be a tornado. Tornado warning is actually like there's been one spotted. Uh, so we're here in kind of middle southwest Kentucky. And thankfully, nothing, it really wasn't even that windy. We did go to the basement. Uh, we do have a basement. My folks are actually staying with us for Christmas and uh, uh, our, my youngest daughter's birthday is today, actually, right? Yeah, today. So I'm recording this very early in the morning. Don't worry. She's not missing anything. Uh, she's still asleep. But we all went in the basement for about two hours. I was kind of like, yeah, all right. I think we're good. <laughs> but what happened about a year ago, uh, there was one in Bowling Green. It's about an hour from us that just like, like it looked like multiple bombs just went off. It's crazy. Tornadoes are very weird. So I don't really think anything touched down, which is nice. Uh, I don't really know how it all works, but praise God. We were praying and reading and just kind of hanging out and that was it. So uh, I did ask my son who's six going on seven to draw me a picture of a tornado these we've got the like lightning strikes right over here yellow and these are bags i think he said or trash these look like jalapenos but he said they're leaves and then of course you've got like the green and the the orange if you're not in the south or the midwest you might be like what it's super weird i don't really know what type of natural disaster i would prefer the most probably earthquakes because that's kind of what i grew up with in california and they're very rare at least generally that you can feel all right, so we're talking about books today. That's why you're here, I hope. Uh, I do have one from last year, uh, from 2022, so go ahead and check that out. Uh, I will say that 2022 was great. I did a year-end wrap-up, so feel free to also uh, grab that and watch that and kind of give you, if you're newer to the channel, that'll give you a better understanding. I was able to go to the most conferences. I traveled the most, which wasn't a lot, but more than I ever have before as far as um both denominationally, quote unquote, I guess, as a pastor. And uh, I preached in a couple chapels and things like that. So that was a lot of fun, preached in a couple other settings that weren't the local church, which I really enjoyed. <clears throat> Hope and pray that 2023 will be uh, more of that um, or the same or more of that. Because uh, it's, it's, I don't know, I enjoy it. So talking about 10 books, we're going to have an honorable mention and also an audio book. So these are all books I have read except maybe one or two where I've only read some of it, but I know the book well enough to recommend it. So in all transparency, uh, number 10, you ready? Number 10, let's get going. No. Number 10 is word smithy. Word smithy. Hot tips for writing for the writing life by Doug Wilson. Now this is very much a, uh, some people really love Doug Wilson. I know a lot of y'all do. He's one of my favorites as well. Um, he really advocates for a mere Christendom. Yes, he's post-mill. Yes, he's a Calvinist. Yes, he's Presbyterian. But those are distinctions that he doesn't put on this high, high shelf to say, hey, look, you know, if you're not this, you're probably a false teacher. You're probably a heretic. Like I've never, he doesn't have that spirit. And it's funny that so many people like just are just pissed off at him. You know, the Big Eva guys and the Big Eva adjacent. It's 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 rather humorous. Probably. I couldn't I can't speak for everybody. Probably because they're jealous, I would imagine. Probably just they're envious because he's he's built a lot and done a lot and has children who follow the Lord and grandchildren who follow the Lord and he's a prolific writer and pastor and everything else. So I would imagine it's probably jealousy. And he's not a hypocrite. 
like he's been writing about this woke stuff and marriage stuff and sexual stuff and crazy stuff for 10, 20, 30 years uh, about a particular subject way longer before most other people. So wordsmithy page 31 says, don't be afraid to have 20 books going at once. That's one quote that I found I resonate with. And I would encourage you, if you're one of those people, you're like, I got a stack of books. I can't, I just can't do it. I'm writing, I'm reading five books at once. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Now I, I do make notes and I'll just, uh, I'll show you here as opposed to the light adjustment, the white balance and all that. I'll just screw it up. So I'll show you in the, in a clip in, but you can see here that um, I do, I do make notes, a lot of notes. I, I forget where I heard it from, but I like to have a working library, a working library where I can look up stuff. You can see the front. Uh, this only has a couple notes where I'll put the number of the page. And I, I, I'd urge you to do this or try this if you're still kind of like, I don't remember what I read or I don't know how you find it. I kind of make my own table of contents. So I'll use like a Q for QAnon, no, for quote. And, you know, I'll write something like, you know, creation debate or Adam or, you know, really good quote or something about C.S. Lewis or whatever, you know, something, oh, for preaching, Romans 3, you know, whatever. And I'll just have some little quick note. So then I can look at it like I did last night and say, ah, I, I remember that. It's way, way easier <clears throat> for that and for me to digest and then actually enjoy. I'm not just, I'm not reading for the sake of reading so I can tell people like you guys, hey, I read these books. I'm so amazing. No, I want these to help me in my preaching, in my life, in my counsel, in my, of course, being a dad, uh, being a husband, being a friend, and um, just being a, a follower of Christ to be sanctified. We're called to renew our minds and we're called to put on the armor of God. We're called to do all these things. Books are not bad. Obviously, if you're reading books about the Bible and not the Bible, that's bad. So don't do that. Always read the scripture. Uh, I would say first and foremost, or at least listen to it, something before you get into a book. So wordsmithy, that was on page 31, just a quick quote. Page 36, another little um, quip from, uh, from, from Wilson. Oops. I'm knocking stuff over. Sorry about that. But you are not cramming for a test. You are simply marking things because this is a good way to read with your eyes open. You read widely to be shaped. That's exactly what I was saying. That's funny. Providential. Hey, all right. Maybe I subconsciously knew this. Not so that you might be prepared to regurgitate. Read like someone who can afford to forget most of what you read. It does not matter because you are still going to be shaped by it. Ah, that's key. That's good. That's good, isn't it? You're still going to be shaped by it. <clears throat> and you are. A lot of people, ah, what's the point? You know, I struggle with that with one or two of my four children. What's the point? Ah, oh, I don't, it's not about, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. I don't care. I've done this before. I've never done this before. Blah, blah, blah. If you're a dad or a mom, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but you're still going to be shaped by it, aren't you? So I'd urge you, this is a great book overall. Um, you know, it's buck 20, 120, 119 pages, something like that. You can get this from Canon Press. Of course, it's Doug Wilson, right? He's part of that, uh, helped start that and all that. So that's just another kind of little quib from Wilson. The book is about writing. It's about technical stuff. It's about, but it's not technical for like technical sake. It gives you some pointers, uh, talks about words, talks about how you phrase things, being, giving practice and just giving some suggestions. So that's number 10 word smithy. Nine, nine expositional preaching by David Helm. Expositional Preaching by David Helm. Now this, I believe, I took a church and state class, was my first class uh, in, it was an elective, got to start right off the bat with electives. Uh, this is several years ago, seven, eight years ago for seminary when I started. And uh, I'm already finished, a couple, finished a couple years ago, but it was good. Church and state, I took a pastoral, um, it was an elective, it was a conference as well, but it was like a pastoral elective for like preaching. And then oh, church history. Yeah. Church history one. So it was great with Michael Haken and that kind of 
All those shape me, as they do, just kind of like when you meet somebody for the first time. And if you're meeting me for the first time, by the way, please do consider liking and subscribing. Uh, Last year, about this time, I just had over 200 subs. I'm knocking on the door of 900. I would really rather look get that to that thousand uh, because that opens up the door for you to kind of blows the doors off, really. Uh, And you can do everything, uh, including get a little bit of ad revenue. Now, certainly I'm not doing this for ads. I'm doing this for... Uh, for fun, for edification, to help you as a community, uh, on and on. Uh, but it would be nice to to have a bag of groceries here and there, uh, be paid, especially by a big tech who, you know, we'll leave it alone at that. But do subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. Uh, it would really help me out. If you're watching this for the first time, uh, or this is your first video, I do weekly videos where I talk about you know, something MacArthur said or did or some scandal or or some dumb uh, woke preacher clip. And I always try and bring it back to scripture. And, you know, the videos are general. Those are called Contra Thoughts. It's kind of just my show uh, where I discuss those things. Uh, generally about anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Those are <clears throat> podcast format in one sense. Uh, I don't know all the differences really. Is this a podcast now? I don't, I don't know what we're doing, I guess. And I also have Contra Talk. I did start a new channel, kind of as a scientific experiment, and I think it's going well. I started that back in mid-September, and I've talked to Doug Wilson, actually. Uh, I've talked to quite a few other people, John Harris, um, quite a few other fellow YouTubers and other people talking about different things related to um, eschatology and soteriology and just church life, some politics, just a lot of different things where I kind of sit back and I ask the questions. I have quite a few talks coming up. Um, got one scheduled with Craig Blomberg, who's a, a New Testament scholar out in Denver, talking to Doug Wilson again. And also, uh, if you've heard about the Frankfurt Declaration about pushing back against the COVID tyranny, I was able to talk to one of the pastors that formed that. Now it's Frankfurt, as in Frankfurt, Germany. There's a Frankfurt. Kentucky and, you know, probably Frankfurt, several other places. So anyway, a little bit of plug for the channel. Back to this, excuse me, expository, expositional preaching. So I believe this was the first book I read in seminary. And I will say it was my first semester. At least I got a little tag right there. Um, I'm encouraged. Yeah, I think it was because this is eight August. I write when I start and end uh, August 30th, 2014. I put it in three hours. I'm a little busier today. I don't think I'd be able to get this out in three hours, unfortunately. Um, so we've got a couple different points I just want to look at. Of course, we're not going to do a whole review. It's really just looking at it. Too many of us unconsciously believe that a well-studied <clears throat> understanding of our cultural context rather than the Bible is key to preaching with power. So I got to understand the culture more than the Bible. Wrong answer, right? Wrong answer. That's that's not that's not the right approach. He says there's some diagrams you can see here. All right. In getting to practical work, I have found it helpful to think about context in two ways: literary context and historical context. These are the two related and often overlapping ideas, but it is worth understanding the difference. The historical context concerns the circumstances or situations that prompted the text, right? So why does Luke write? Well, he's writing for Theophilus, you know, and then he writes Luke, uh, he writes Luke, he writes Acts, almost a whole bulk of a third of the New Testament. Most people don't know that. Maybe you did. Anyway. The historical context concerns the situation prompted by the text. This may require you to understand ancient culture. See, this is the thing. And this is something that we need to understand. We can't just, we can't, we can, but you don't get very much out of it. You're just kind of like, uh. We can open up the Bible and just read it. So here's what it says. Yeah, but what's he talking about? What does Jesus mean when he says this? Or what is Paul talking about when he says that? Or what does John mean? Because he's referencing these certain people. He's talking about these people, those things. You can't just say, well, uh, it means it's this. He's talking about he's talking about the Democrats. Damn Democrats. Why talking about Democrats? He's talking about my church. He's talking about that person in my church. He's talking about you. Right? We see this in Matthew 24. People read themselves into it. This generation will pass away. Well, who's Jesus talking about? He's talking to that generation. He's not talking to us. He's not talking to people living during World War II or during the Black Plague, hundreds and hundreds of years after that text is written. He's talking to that generation. 
but people that's one of the main texts for you know a futurist eschatology and a third temple and all that other stuff he's not talking about that he's talking about the temple then that they're looking at then the context is then not us literary context on the other hand simply the text around your text so very very good and then lastly page 64 i'd really encourage you to do this if you want to have a book that is you're like how do i preach i've got this one i've got another one so pick up both of these read these um and and devour them and i hope they're they're helpful they're small you know you can knock them out in a day if you have if you have a day to just read but make notes make notes make notes make your library work for you. I've, I've met guys who are like, oh, I don't write in my books. It's like, I mean, I guess. But why are you preserving these? Will these someday be in a library? I mean, they're in a library right now. But will they be donated to someplace or my grandkids have them? Maybe. But I'd rather my grandkids see my writings, you know, from 2020 or, you know, 2050 or whatever. And, oh, I don't know, my grandpa thought that. Or, oh, that's interesting or whatever. I don't have some grandeur thinking somebody's going to write some big biography and I'm some famous theologian or something. Uh, <clears throat> but rather it's like, this is probably for your family or maybe some seminary student 30 years from now is going to read this book. Like, oh, wow. Look at all these highlights. That's kind of cool. You know, paper books aren't going away, by the way. And these are so much better. I, I'm 99% of the time paper, 95% of the time paper, 4% of the time audio and 1% of the time digital before i'm talking a lot but i hope this is helpful i hope this is helpful i really do uh i think i think it should be spurgeon or or has he got reading with the instincts of spurgeon he says it might be helpful to consider a more recent figure whose approach to reading the bible puts jesus in the center the great baptist preacher prince of preachers charles Haddon spurgeon captured this idea he says don't you know, young man, that from every town, every village, and every little hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road that leads to London. So, from every text, there is a road that leads to Christ. And my dear brother, your business is, when you get to a text, to say now, what is the road to Christ? I have never found a text that I have not got a road, it, that has not gotten a road text that has, had not, got a road to Christ in it. He says, Spurgeon has the right instincts. He's asking, how does my text anticipate or relate to the gospel? So number nine, expositional preaching by Helm. Number eight, number eight, number eight, number eight. Number eight. Ready? King James only controversy. This is the older version. Forward by Norm Geisler, written by James R. Albert Moeller White. No, James R. White. All the guys with the initials. I don't know. Number eight. Number eight. <clears throat> I've only read some of this. So this is one of those books. Um, the last book was about 120 pages. Uh, this is 250, 260. This is really good if you have a King James only guy or gal or you're in that area. I'm kind of in that area now. The church is not that I pastor is not King James only. If I preach from the King James, they'd probably be fine with it. Uh, some of the people have King James. I have no issue with the King James. Um, but we'll see here in a moment one of the quotes that the King James, and I'll look more at one of these. I saw it last night when I was doing doing finishing my research. But it ha King James is like the last in line of English Bibles. And it's like, and then, of course, you have the modern ones. And they always started the standard. And this is the thing. I love you, King James only ears. But, like, you're ill-informed. Okay? And usually it's people who are you know, independent, fundamentalist, Baptist. Da, da, da. Okay. Well, all Baptist churches are independent. Most all community churches, Bible churches are all independent. Calvary Chapel churches, John MacArthur type churches, they're all independent. So to say, I'm independent. Yeah, we're all independent. Uh, you know, we're not Methodist or Presbyterian. Uh, but more than that, <clears throat> not that there's anything wrong with that per se. More than that, though, you're you're just ill-informed as far as what is going on. Like Acts 8, uh, 34, for example, with the Ethiopian eunuch, there's no verse 34 in the modern translations. And people are like, oh, they're taking my mother. This happens two or three times in Acts. I think it's three times. And where there's not a verse in the newer Bible, the ESV, which is usually what I use. And ASB is great. NIV, 
can be good. New Living Translation, I like that, but that's more kind of a paraphrase. Um, CSB, things like that. Those all pull from a group of texts where the King James only pulls from one. So we'll see here in a moment what what James White's even talking about. So I'd recommend this book um, for this because, you know, it's got little diagrams you'll see. I'll just show you in the insert here. <clears throat> Different diagrams to really help us understand uh, what is going on. So page 63 into 64, this shows the textual differences. So this is a closer look at the textus receptus. So the TR, you'll see this for short if you're a text guy, if you want to study the text, you're, you're a gal who loves linguistics and look in the history, great. You'll see TR, textus receptus. The, the textual differences that exist between the King James or the KGB and the modern translations of the Bible, such as NASB or NIV, are due to uh, ESV wasn't written yet, so he's not. He doesn't ever reference it. It's not like he doesn't like it. It's just it's not doesn't exist. <clears throat> it's a new bot. It's a modern translation. Sorry. <laughs> it's like I have voices in my head sometimes. I don't, but are due to the fact that TR follows the Byzantine type text. So just one. So TR Texas Receptus, which use which the King James uses. <clears throat> Is the one text. So there's a group of texts called the Byzantine text. This isn't to discount the King James. I'm not saying the King James is terrible. I'm not saying it's heretical. I'm not saying it's a bad translation. I'm just saying this is the brute fact of the matter. If you want something scholarly, this is what it is. Well, modern texts draw from Alexandrian, Western, Caesarean, and Byzantian type texts. Okay. So there's four. Pulling from four, you get four times as much stuff. So there's a collection and then they compare. And they're not radically different at all. They're all so, so close so often. <clears throat> There's a few tweaks here and there. And it's not like the these and thous and King James and like that's what the Byzantine used. No, that's just the top type of English that gets erased. I mean, if I were to choose between King James and New King James, I'd pick the King New King James every time just because it, it, it smooths out a lot of those rough spots that nobody talks like that. And it's very detached. And sometimes you have to. Uh, some, we've supported ministries in the past and they quote King James and you have to like a third of the verses, you know, three or four verses and 30% of them. You're like, I have to interpret this English word to even understand what's going on. I already, we already have to interpret the text. I don't want to also interpret words that aren't used in the modern vernacular. It doesn't mean it's bad. Nobody else walks around and speaks the queen's English. People in England don't speak the queen or King's English. They just don't. Right. They're just as sloppy and weird and have all sorts of nuances like we do here. Uh, page 78, page 78. Modern King James follow a revision made by Benjamin Blaney in 1769. Jack Lewis notes that Blaney did extensive revision, added 76 notes, including many on weights, measures and coins and added 3,495 new marginal references. So this is one big thing, the revisions. There's revisions in the King James. Some people are like, this is the oldest Bible. It's the newest one. This is the one Jesus used. And it's like, well, of course he didn't because it was in, well, I don't know, the 17th century English, right? So obviously nobody really believes that. I hope, I hope they don't. Uh, but then there's revisions that are 150 years later, 1769, for example. Well, all of a sudden now you have this kind of, this edifice that's gone. I find people are just so in the weeds with one particular thing that, that you just got to step back. And I'm probably, <clears throat> I'm probably in the weeds with some stuff too. I, I, no doubt. Be willing to step back and think, hmm, maybe he's got a point. Maybe she's right. Maybe I've never thought of that. And I likewise have you. If you think you're settled in all your theology, I guarantee you you're not. Okay. Especially if you have some question that's itching about end times or the beginning or soteriology or Bible translations or something. Dig into that, look into that and say, huh, I've always thought that guy was a heretic. I always thought that those types of people were wrong. I always thought, you know, I'm King James only. I th always thought the NIV was, you know, the devil's translation, whatever, right? <clears throat> it's not. Okay. Is I, do I like NIV? Not really. I'm not a huge fan. Don't ever read the passion translation, by the way. That is a heretical, terrible, almost as bad, if not as bad as the Jehovah Witness Translation, the New World Translation. Don't read the Passion Translation. I, I, I'm i telling you, as your friend, as your... Last one. 
146. There are no grand conspiracies. And there isn't. And that's the thing that a lot of people, oh, they're taking Bible verses out. They're taking it out. No, they're not. What they're doing is looking back at further older texts that aren't there. Because the trick is most of the things why you see like a verse 34 in chapter 8, these are notes that are written probably in the 6th, 7th century, 10th century, whatever. And later on, people are copying and they're like, ah, should I put this in there? Should is it? Is it? Is it? I don't know. What do you think, Steve? I mean, is it? Should I? Do you have that? Yeah, let's put it in. Well, they're all written by hand. There's no printing press. There's no digital files. There's no, you know, backups, right? None of that. And so they don't want, they, they love God's word so much that they want to keep it in. But then people go back who also love God's word back to the third century and say, hey, verse 30, there is no verse 34, but we've already numbered the verses. And so they're like, well, tell you what, we've already, we've already done this. There's a lot of scholarship. There's already 300 years of commentaries or whatever. We're just going to leave and just jump to 35 and just erase 34 because 34 was likely not in the original. That's the trick. 34 or whatever verse was likely not in the original because it's not there, right? It's like if you wrote a letter to your wife and then a hundred years later, your great grandchildren, you know, write a little note in there. And then for some reason, somebody's copying it 300 years later. They think, is this, that's not like a hint. Is that the right, right? That doesn't look like the same handwriting. Should we, let's make a new copy and we'll just, we'll just put it as a parenthesis, right? Ending of Mark, that's another one, chapter 16 of Mark. Uh, look into that if you want. After verse 9, there is no, in the oldest text, it's not there. Now, does this mean your Bible's flawed? No. Does this mean that it means that the Bible's real? <laughs> and it means that we can trust it because there's people that are so up, up, up and uptight in a good way to say, no, I love the Bible and I want it to be this way. This video is going longer than I wanted it to be. Now I'm just talking about all sorts of stuff. But anyway. It seems fair to say that the majority of passages examined in the preceding texts, pages, excuse me, translations such as the NASB, NIV, have been seen to surpass the King James with reference to clarity and ease of comprehension, far more than the reverse. No grand conspiracies have been uncovered. No attempts to hide doctrines or beliefs by mistranslating the text have been found. What we have discovered is the comparison of various translations of the Bible is often very useful in ascertaining the meaning of the passages being studied and that the KJV is one of those many fine translations available for just a task. When used in conjunction with such a fine modern translation, the New King James, NIV, NASB, and King James adds noble a noble rendering to the list and is often helpful in grasping the literal meanings of the terms involved. End quote. Number eight, King James controversy. Number seven, moving right along, we'll try and pick up the pace a little bit so this video is not four hours. I was hoping for an hour, but probably more like an hour and a half. We'll see. Created in God's image by Tony, Tony Hokuma. It's another seminary book. This is more academic. We're looking at 250, 250 pages or so. You can see the thickness a little bit more, about an inch and a half thick. Something like that. This is a great book because it's showing um, who we are made in God's image. It's, it's a little more, I read it for systematic. Uh, that was more a um, salvation, doctrine of man class. Systematic theologies can be very thick, very deep. They can be helpful. They can be very unhelpful too, because not everybody's a systematizer. Not everybody gleans from it as much as <clears throat> other people. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. There's a lot of quotes. I'm just going to pull two real quick. Page six, right at the beginning. Yeah, this is my second, third semester, or something like that. Page six. To be a creature means that I cannot move a finger or utter a word apart from God. We're dependent, right? We're dependent on God. Even if you're, even if you differ with, say, a, a Calvinist understanding of salvation or something like that, and, or you're a determinist, even which most Calvinists aren't, but some are. Uh, but there's other oh, free will and this and okay, any of it. Whatever it is, we're dependent on God because he made us, right? It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So to be a creature means I cannot move a finger or utter a word apart from God. To be a person, here we go, here's a good distinction, means that when my fingers are moved, I move them. So God doesn't meticulously move your fingers, right? I move them, and that when the words are uttered by my lips, I utter them. To be creatures means that God is the potter and we are the clay, Romans 9. And to be the persons means that we are the ones who fashion our lives by our own decisions. Galatians 6. It's a good little, you know, human responsibility type thing. And there's there's more on that. You know, there's there's always more study. Uh, there's some 
just there's lots out there, right? Don't just listen to one voice though. Build your own theology. Like I said a moment ago, don't just sit there and think I've got all this figured out. You don't, I don't. Uh, but if there's something scratching, if there's something itching, go into it, go after it, read, ask me if you want. Hey, do you know any good books on this? I'll put my email in the description. And uh, in fact, I'll just put it here too, because I can, why not? There's my email. If you want to email me, drop that there. Uh, and again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. I would appreciate it trying to get to that thousand. I know I will, uh, but I'm just, I'm just impatient, you know, and I want to have that burning in the bosom like the Mormons have. So, um, <laughs> sorry. I had a good conversation with a Mormon guy a couple of weeks ago on a, on a plane, but anyway, that's another conversation. Page 113. Page 113. This is about Adam, original sin. It is my conviction that the denial of Adam and Eve and that Adam and Eve were actual persons who once lived on the, oh, you know, and let me back up. Hold on. Uh, most recently, H.M. Kutert, Kutert, K, K, something like that, a professor of theology at Free University of Amsterdam has stated that we must not understand Adam as a historical figure, but rather as a pedagogical example of a teaching model. An illustration of what happens to every man, which helps us understand the significance and reality of Jesus. So I guess Jesus is just a second pedagogical example, right? He didn't really die for your sins, right? He didn't really shed his blood. He didn't really live a perfect life, right? Right, right, right. This is what happens. I know John Harris is going through right now. Uh, if you're watching this later, of course, you'll have more videos, you know, six months from now or whatever. But go back to January 2023 and find his stuff on Keller. He's going through a book examining Keller. So a guy's writing about Keller and his wacky beliefs because they're really bad. They're really bad. Um and Keller denies, he more or less denies a literal Adam. He believes in theistic evolution and all that. Very, very bad. Very bad. So he goes on, sorry. It is my conviction that the denial of Adam and Eve, and this is mine as well, that were actual persons who once lived on this earth, an understanding of Adam and Eve as symbols or teaching models is based on an incorrect understanding of scripture. The Genesis account is not only biblical reference to the first man, excuse me, uh, based on incorrect, the Genesis account is not only Biblical reference to the first man, the genealogy in the first chapter, also in First Chronicles, begins with Adam, obviously treating him as a historical person. Similarly, in Jesus in Luke 3, ends with the following, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. This verse clearly places Adam at the beginning of a historical person and indicates that Adam came into existence not through natural generation, but a creative act of God, end quote. So very good. Created in God's image, Anthony Hokema or Tony uh, bigger book, a little more textbook if you want something that's a little bit deeper. That is 10, 9, 8, 7, 7. Number six, another textbook I read in seminary. <clears throat> Maybe I should get all my seminary books together and show y'all. So again, if you want to... Right here. It's like a reverse. There we go. Email me if you have any questions uh, or you want to support me somehow. Hey, I want to give you some you know, food money or gas money or something like that. I love your ministry. Let me help. How do I do that? Let me know. 40 questions about interpreting the Bible. Number six, right? Six, six, sorry, lose count. Number six, 40 questions, page 70. Now this is 40 questions and you'll look at different ones. And there's, this is a series. There's a bunch. Uh, there's different sections, part one, part two, uh, and three, four. And they're all different stuff. What is the Bible? That's one of the questions question how is the bible organized who wrote the bible does god uh, does the bible contain error drop down why is the bi biblical interpretation important who determines the meaning of the text what is the role of the holy spirit in determining the meaning these are really good especially for my roman catholic supporters and anti-supporters who hate me uh this is a great book because you know again the pope's fallible right and everybody's fallible everybody is not god no one's Christ but Jesus, right? And so we have to understand these things based on context. That's how you understand the text. You use scripture to interpret scripture, not outside sources because they're quote unquote more important or something. Scripture to interpret scripture. And then you can use history in a general sense, but that's not even, that's that's good, but it's not, it's not the rule, right? Um, it's helpful, but it's not always the case. Oh, here it is. 
So the first Bible, by the way, the first English Bible, 1382, the Wycliffe Bible. So that's hundreds of years before the King James. Then you have the Tyndale Bible, Coverdale Bible, Matthew Bible, the Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, and the Dewey Rames. That's Roman Catholics like that one. That came out right before the King James in 1610. <laughs> and so it's like the King James is like the last in line, not the first, ultimately, uh, of English translations. But King Jamesers, King James only ears don't like that very much. Page 70. Page 70. Uh, while the official language of the church, <clears throat> a few portions of the Bible were translated into Old English, Anglo-Saxon, from the 7th century to the 11th century. In 1382, the famous reforming church leader, John Wycliffe, so Martin Luther wasn't the first reformer. We got Wycliffe, Huss, Jan Huss, a bunch of other people. 1382, famous reformer, John Wycliffe, translated the entire Bible into English of his day, Middle English. So it's still very, very difficult for us to understand today. But you can, if you know the context and you know the certain tweaks and words and things, you could do it. The translation was based on the Latin Vulgate, a so-so translation. It wasn't based on the Greek or the Hebrew, right? So we lost some things in translation. Just like if you take a movie title even, and it gets translated into Cantonese, and then from Cantonese back into English, it gets all weird because they have different words. Language is different. Look at Babel. Please see Genesis, what, 9, 10, 10? 10, I think it's Babel. Not the point. Rabbit trail. The translation based on Latin Vulgate was copied by hand, and the printing press had not been introduced to Europe yet. Followers of Wycliffe continued to call for reform of the church. Luther wasn't the first one, guys. Not at all. He was the last in the line, really, or one of the last. <clears throat> reform the church and the monarchy based on biblical truth they were reading. That's why they kept the Bible. This is why the Bible in the language is so important. This is why even my, my Roman Catholic friends... You need to understand that the Bible translated and having it in the people's language, that's vital. That's And they kept it in the dark for centuries, or they tried as best they could. And Wycliffe, hundreds of years before Luther, was saying the same thing as Luther, as Calvin, as Zwingli, many others. Because the Bible is for everybody. It's not just for the elite scholars. The Bible's for everybody. Very quickly, church officials and the king judged the availability of the Bible in English as a threat to the status quo. Mm -hmm. 1414 regarding the Bible, reading the Bible rather was a capital offense. Reading the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, reading the Bible, we're just, we're just going to stop with that because it's so good. Reading the Bible was a capital offense in 1414. You think persecution, oh, persecution, oh, America, the Democrats are going to come get me, the government, oh, these people, I got canceled. Reading the Bible, reading it. I hope you would be guilty. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Number five, number five. Two, three, four, five. Yes, number five. Yeah, number five. <clears throat> Why Johnny can't preach. This was also that same class, preaching class, right? Yeah, fall semester 2014. And great little book, much shorter than some of these other ones. It's about 100 pages, less than 100, 98, something like that. Yeah, just over 100. Why Johnny can't preach by T. David Gordon. There's those initials again. Kind of weird, arrogant thing to say. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Where are you? Somewhere. There it is. My little notes. Number 14, page 14. Further, I wish to clarify that I do not mean that ministers wrongly or defensively assume. I mean that we do not have many great preachers in our day. And this is written, you know, like 2012. Right? This is over a decade. I don't care about its presence or absence of wit. What I really care about is the average Christian family in the average pew in the average church on average Sunday morning. And the problem is that we don't have the, the problem is that they is not that we don't have great preachers. In many circumstances, we don't even have mediocre preachers. Now that's convicting for me because I think I can wrap a trail as you would imagine. <clears throat> I know I can. And, you know, it's a temptation to, you know, extemporaneously or be filled with the spirit as it were. Uh, and in not writing scripture, so I'm saying, but you know, a thought comes to mind, but you got to keep those under control, which is something I'm working on. And those who are watching this, who are members of my, of the church, not my church, the church I pastor, uh, I'm working on it. So please be patient. <laughs> please be patient. Sometimes I'm like, man, I was, why did I talk so long? Why did I preach so long? 
Anyway, I hope it's helpful. I hope the Lord uses it. Page 22, another little quib, as it were. My anecdotal observation about the nature of preaching today has also been reinforced perhaps a hundred times by casual conversations I have with people who I meet. If they are churched, I ask them where they live, where they go to church, whether they are happy in their church. And the ordinary person says, yes. And then I ask, what do you think about your minister? Most of the time, pastor, uh, most of the time they reply, the pro reply I get is, well, he's not a great preacher, but which we all know is just a polite way of saying that he's a poor preacher. It's a kind of charitable way of saying, well, we don't really benefit from his preaching, but he's a very good minister in other ways, end quote. That convicts me because I don't know. I mean, I can't I can't really understand uh, or fully get my uh, my own preaching. Right. Because I'm me. I do sometimes re-listen to it. And if you're a pastor or you're aspiring to do that, you want to preach. I'd encourage you to uh, listen to some of your listen to some of your sermons. Page 58, page 58. Last one. Let's see here. According to a widely cited 1989, it's a little bit old, study, the average weekday network shows a soundbite from a presidential candidate shrank from 42 seconds in 1968 to 9.8 seconds in 1988. This is before the internet, right? This is when we're all, <clears throat> you know, small children or we don't even exist yet. With only 1% of the bites lasting more than 40 seconds. By 2000, the average is 7.8 seconds. What kinds of ministers... What kinds of ministers does such a culture produce? Ministers who are not at home with the significant. Ministers whose attention span is less than that of a four-year-old in the 1940s, who race around like the rest of us, constantly distracted by sounds and images of inconsequential trivials and out of touch with what is weighty. Man, that is good too. <clears throat> And that's convicting again for me because, man, I get sucked into trivial stuff. That is number five, why Johnny can't preach. Number five, pick it up. Pick up that one. Pick up the other one. Expository Preaching by Helm. Very, very helpful book. Number four, Catherine Park. This is an auto, not an autobiography, although some of it does have her writing in it. This is one of King Henry's like 40 wives or whatever it was. Um, but she was actually a believer. By all accounts, she was a believer, like a real Christian who really loved Jesus, who really wanted to see the church, the culture, uh, the monarchy change. Uh, she lost her head for it. Uh, Henry is considered a Christian, Protestant. Uh, I doubt he was actually, you know, born again, really actually walking by, by faith. Um, <clears throat> but I haven't studied him a ton, so I can't fully say to that. And I'm not him. So anyway, this is a uh, hundred and some odd, 50, 65 pages. And it has a lot of little devotions from her. I'll read, a, I'll read a little segment from some of her writings. Really, really helpful. She writes, and just let this sink in again. What did my last book just say? The average person has the attention span of a four-year-old in the 1940s. So everybody who's old now, when they were children, their attention span as a four-year-old is what most people are today. And sadly, I, I, I mean, that's me too. You know, getting split... You know, turn off notifications if you can. Uh, silence your phone. Don't watch TV. Turn off your TV. And turn off Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, they're all just they're all just distracting, trivial things. Like ninety plus percent of the time, they're very, very little helpfulness. If you want a little wisdom for the day, you want a little encouragement. You've been thinking about that. Just do it. Just do it because it's not worth it. And I, I'm going to have to take my advice. I have to a degree, but I think I need to go further. When I consider in the bethinking of mine evil and wretched former life, mine obstinate, stony, and untrackable heart to have so much exceeded in evilness that it hath not only neglected, yea, contempted and despised God's holy precepts and commandments but also embraced, received, and esteemed vain and foolish and feigned trifles. I am partly by the hate I owe to my sin, who hath reigned in me, partly by the love I owe to all Christians, whom I am content to edify when with the example of mine own shame, forced 
and constrained with my heart and words to confess and declare to the world how ingrate, ne negligent, unkind, and stubborn I have been to God my creator, and how beneficial, merciful, and gentle he hath been always to me, his creature, being such a miserable and wretched sinner, end quote. Woo! Ain't nobody writing like that today. Almost. Almost no one. Now, this is 500 years ago. I understand. Almost 500 years ago. But we're not a progressive state. We're not a <clears throat> culture in some, I mean, just turn on TikTok. Look at the news. Watch some video of car chases. I mean, we're, we're idiots. <laughs> Even in the church. We're trivial. We're pithy. We're annoying. It's, it's unbelievable, right? Another section. This is by Winthrop, by the way. Brandon Withrop. Winthrop. Withrop. Withrow. Withrow. Excuse me. <laughs> With, like rowing a boat. W-I-T-H-R-O-W. I'll put it in the description. All these will be in the description. And again, if you want to email me, there's my email. Let us therefore now, I pray you, by faith behold and consider a great charity and goodness of God in sending his son to suffer death for our redemption. When we were his mortal enemies and after what sort of manner he sent him first to be considered, yea, to be the undoubtedly with a perfect faith believed that God sent him to us freely for he did give him and sold him not a more noble and rich gift. He could have not given. He sent not a servant or a friend, but his son, John three sixteen. So dearly beloved, not in the delights, riches, and honors, but in crosses, poverties, and slanders, not as a Lord, but as a servant, Philippians 2, 7. Yea, and the most vile and painful passions to wash us, not with water, but with his own precious blood, not from the mire, but from the puddle of filth of our iniquities. He hath given him not to make us poor, but to enrich us with his divine virtues, merits, graces, yea, and in him he hath given us all good things, and finally himself, and that with such great charity as cannot be expressed. At page 101, there on the Catherine Parr book, very good, very, very good. It's number four, number four. Number three, this is a great little book. I've read uh, not all of this either, although I, I reread it. I read several chapters and then reread it. Um, was it yesterday? I guess it was yesterday. And so <clears throat> really, really good. This is 2084. There we go. It's got a cool cover. See that metallic. Nice. That's not going to show up. Maybe that'll show up. Hopefully it'll show up. 1984, 2084. So this is a play on 1984, of course. This is 2084 with John Lennox. By the way, John Lennox, a uh, mathematician, He's kind of like a modern C.S. Lewis, where Lewis wrote about all sorts of things. Lennox does. They're both at Oxford. They're both rubbing shoulders with godless pagan atheists. Lennox talks to and, and, and debates publicly and probably privately with Dawkins all the time. He's my favorite atheist, by the way. Old Dickie D, Dr. Dickie D. He's so hilarious in, in his things. Um, but <laughs> he's not trying to be hilarious, of course, but he is to me anyway. This is really good because it's talking about transhumanism. This is something I really, I would wager money you're not even thinking about uh, at all. I don't think the average person, the average Christian is even thinking about it. Uh, and this is written in 2019. So it's new, but it's not like brand spanking new. Transhumanism is huge. Uh, Elon Musk, who, you know, used to be just a guy, a billionaire. Now he's, you know, everybody hates him uh, or loves him. He also has a company called another company called Neuralink, where basically you drill a hole inside the skull and you put a, like a web over the brain and it connects to the Internet. Now, a lot of people don't do this, of course, but uh, he believes that it's a demon in one sense. You're conjuring a demon. He's been said uh, he's definitely more of a spiritual guy than some of these other godless billionaires like Zuckerberg or somebody um, not saying he's Christian like the Babylon Bee, you know, jokingly made him. But. Nevertheless, he, he knows that artificial intelligence, computing, all these things are a real threat, a real threat. Now, again, is it going to be like Terminator, a minority report or or the Matrix? Probably not. You know, it'll probably be more like Mad Max or 
some other dystopian type thing. It's not going to be like The Handmaid's Tale. Sorry, liberals. It's not going to happen. So I would say pick this book up. It's small. It's a hundred, it's almost 200 pages, but it's small, right? It's like, what is this? Like eight by five, right? So it's a smaller book, real page turner, just because of the size of the pages. And it's not very deep. You can see here as far as the uh, line to page ratio. So page 12, page 12, Lennox writes, Orwell warns that we will be overcome by eternally externally imposed oppression. But Huxley, so Orwell 1984, um, Huxley is Brave New World. Huxley's vision is no big brother, is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore their technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared was those who would ban books. What Huxley feared is that there would be no reason to ban books because no one would want to read them. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared that those who would give us so much information that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned out in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become captive a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. In short, Orwell feared that we have what we have will that what we have in our hate will ruin us. Huxley feared what we love will ruin us. What do you think? We are so brave new world, aren't we? I just learned that they made a TV show that a couple years ago. Um, There's no reason to ban books because people are so ignorant and and told by guys like Andrew Tate, you know, don't read, you know, live your experience, blah, blah, blah. People like that. People in the culture gobble junk like that up. Does that mean he should get canceled? No. Does that mean I like him? No. Is he a total scumbag? Yes. But he has some good points, right? But it should be Christian pastors more should be me for my congregation and and others online it shouldn't be these squishy mushy middle crt loving woke nonsense you know pseudo gay affirming whatever i mean supposedly andrew tate's a muslim now because muslims stand on this truth and why would i be a christian there's no christians that stand on the truth you say you have god's word in the bible and you don't even care about it you don't defend it like what's wrong with you he's got a good point he writes about um dan brown so of course da vinci code guy he quotes Dan Brown in this book called Origin, where he's kind of basing this on a, on a fictional character. Or he's basing on a real character, his fictional character, um, by the last name of Kirsch, Edmund Kirsch. And basically, Dan Brown's an atheist skeptic guy. He used to be a Christian, so-called. Uh, and he's writing, of course, to try and work himself out. I, that's what writers do. You know, we, we they uh, want to write because... They want a book published, right? They want they want that story seen, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, whether Kirsch's vic, uh, fictitious verdict arises from his atheistic philosophy. Science does not support it. <clears throat> also, in any case, and this is talking about the fictional character that Dan Brown's writing about. Also, in any case, fatal to Kirsch's case in his false conviction that the laws of nature can do the job of producing life. He is not only the one to think so. Another example of a basic under misunderstanding of the nature of law is given in well-known physicist Paul Davies, who said, quote, there is no need to invoke anything supernatural in the origins of life. I have never liked the idea of divine tinkering. For me, it is much more inspiring to believe that a set of mathematical laws can be so clever as to bring all these things into being. So right there, Davies, I don't really like divine tinkering. I don't like that. Well, nobody's tinkering. God is the creator. <clears throat> Are you going to tell an architect that, you know, he's tinkering with the building, you know, the 50 story building that he designed and people built? What? That's nonsense. <clears throat> it's stupid, right? Like, it's not tinkering at all. I don't like that, though. And that's the key, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? That's the key is atheists, skeptics, agnostics, oftentimes, oftentimes progressive Christians, they're all the same. They're just unbelievers. Oftentimes don't want God telling them what to do, right? Divine laws don't care who you have sex with, don't care whether you steal something, don't care whether you 
lie. It just doesn't, man. You just live your life however you want. You know, you buy your appetites. You run. I'm not letting some pastor, some guy, some old dead book tell me how to live my life. I know better than that. Right? You've heard this before. But stuff doesn't ever create anything, right? This is the biggest argument against materialistic evolution, atheism, and all the rest. But they think, well, we have this computer that was designed by people that can somehow compute and go back in time in hopes of creating life. And it's like, but you're putting intentionality into this particular thing. Just like AI is still, there's a mind behind this AI. Oh, it's learning. Now they call it AI, artificial intelligence. There's also artificial general intelligence. And I'll be talking with a friend uh, Jay Williams, he's getting his PhD in this, and uh, we're talking soon. The, that conversation will be on Contra Talk channel, so look out for that. So go over there, check that out um, if you're watching this later. But I'll put the link in the description. I'll pop it up here as well. It, it's 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 a worldview. It's not just quote unquote science. We're not just oh yeah progress, yay progress. Like if you're progressing towards a cliff, that's not progress. You got to stop and turn around, and go get off the cliff. And so a lot of people just don't even really consider that. They just they just don't. He goes on, like I said, I have not read all of this. Uh, but of course, Lennox is a believer. He's actually the uncle of uh, Kristen Getty. Not like that really matters, but I kind of think that's cool. So that's number three, 2084. Check that out. Really good book. Really helpful. Um, I'll have some other descriptions. Get a lot more deeper with Jay Williams, soon to be Dr. Williams at some point. There's a deep spiritual element to it as well about that. Number two, number two, number two. Thoughts for young men. This is J.C. Ryle, late 19th century theologian. Really, really thin little book. You can see here, 80 pages, 60 pages. Yeah, 60 pages, less than 60, 58. This is the Canon Press version. So you can find this at Canon Press. Introduction by Michael Foster. Uh, so that that uh, guy, pastor, husband, father, guy who just says basic, normal things, and you know people get upset about it, about male and female. But he's a great, uh, great, great, great guy. I've got his book. I've not read it, but hopefully we'll read that this year and recommend it next year. It's good to be a man. It's good to be a man. His book, which it sounds so sex. That means women suck. No, it doesn't mean women suck at all. That just means it's good to be a man. And he likes being a man. There's nothing wrong with that. Thoughts? Here it is. Page 11. Page 11. This is a page turner, for sure. Um, I haven't really done too much critique on any of these. I will say the one critique with this, it kind of feels like you're just always up here. Not like it's angsty, but it's just kind of flying in, in one mode. Which isn't a bad thing, per se. Uh, it's still very, very good. I would still highly recommend you get it. This one or another version, again, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, Canon Press has like this heritage series, the covers that look like this. I've got others around here. I don't work for Canon Press or anything like that, but they've got good stuff. Young man, this enemy is working hard for your destruction. This is Satan himself. Working hard for your destruction, however little you may think. You are his prize for which he is specially contending. He foresees you must either be a blessing, be the blessings or the curses of your day. And he is trying hard to affect a place in your hearts early in your life in order that you may help advance his kingdom each day. Well, does he understand that the spoil, to spoil the bud is the surest way to mar the flower. Mm, very poetic, uh, but also very real. So if you have a young man in your life, or if you're a young man, if you're a man, really, <laughs> but especially if you're, if you're talking like south of 20, uh, 20 years old, 18, 20, get this book. I just had a thought I'm probably going to pick up a couple and just give them to a few guys I know um, because they need it. And this is written like, you know, 130 years ago. It's not new. And you read this and you're like, oh man, that's happening today. Oh man, what would he think about now? <laughs> you know, and it's just like uh, it's it's discouraging and encouraging in the sense that it's discouraging because we haven't made any progress, contrary to the lies that we're told. It's encouraging because there's nothing new under the sun, ladies and gentlemen. There just isn't. 
right? And so the human mind, male or female, young or old, we struggle with the same stuff. Lust, gossiping, envying, bitterness, right? We struggle with that. People struggle with that 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago in the Bible in and throughout the Old and New Testament. This is why the Bible deals with reality. It's not some fictional fantasy book. This is why I'm a Christian. One of the many reasons, because the Bible deals with fact. It deals with the human heart. It deals with God's washing and his redemption. This is why Jesus is so vital. If you don't know Christ, if you're just watching this, getting to this point, maybe you are. I don't know how long this will be up on you know the World Wide Web for forever and ever, I suppose. I don't know. Probably not. It doesn't matter. If you don't know Jesus, turn to Christ. He is the God-man. He is God who added humanity to himself because of the sins of the world, right? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist says. doesn't mean you're automatically washed and perfect. It means you surrender, and God's love through Christ is sufficient to clean you, to wash you, to make you new, okay? It's huge. Jesus is not just a moral example. He's not just a good teacher. Jesus is better. He's better than your sin. He's better than your lust. He's better than your gossip, your envy, your marriage is on the rocks. You hate your parents. <clears throat> you don't like your job. You hate your place in life, whatever it is. Jesus, I'm not going to say he automatically fixes those things because he doesn't. But what he does is he gives you an eternal joy here and now. And when you surrender, you're enlisted in his army. You're fighting for the truth. Because there's an enemy, as he just said, as Ryle just said, that there is an enemy who loves to destroy. Or rather drag people down to the pits of utter darkness. Or get Christians so concerned, oh, am I really saved? Oh, am I really doing enough? Oh, does God really love me? Oh, this, oh, this. We all struggle with that. Okay? But something like this, a book like this, especially this ancient wisdom of, of dead guys or gals uh, with Catherine Parr, for example. Get it. Devour it. Let this sink in. Okay? Let these things sink in and 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 learn from the past. Don't be so foolish as to think, you know, I'm going to read the latest new book, the latest theology. I prefer, honestly, between you and me, I prefer to read dead guys uh, or, you know, almost dead guys <laughs> because, you know, they've, they've fought the fight. They finished the race. Have We'll get to our grand finale with a little honorable mention and a digital book. So technically 12 books total, one for each month. But these are the top 10 that I'd urge you to read this year. 23, page 23, foolish talking and kidding and joking. It's something I struggle with. I do probably can see it. And you're like, shut up, dude. Just, just, just do the thing. And excessive amusement are all too common. This is written in like 1890, man, 130 years ago. <laughs> foolish talking and kidding and joking and excessive amusement are all too common. I don't argue the fact that there is a time for all these things. Amen. But to be always flippant and joking is anything but wise. What does the wisest of men say? Quote, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, and living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. It's true. I've had a hard week, personally. And it's been pretty rough and there's been a lot of junk and I'll spare you the details, but be real here for a moment. I've cried two or three times in the last week for different reasons. And, you know, it's, it's good. Uh, be a little vulnerable here for a moment. It's good. Sorrow is good for the heart, right? Because we are creatures as we've looked at two different separate books. We're creatures. We're made in God's image. We're not worms, but we're sinners. And this world is full of sorrows. This world is broken both in our own heart. This is why we need Christ. This is why we need redemption. This is why we need to be washed and renewed. Sorrow is better than laughter, for a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is the house of pleasure. Ecclesiastes 7. Last quote, page 50 into 51. Thoughts for young men. There is a certain kind of mysterious power in the faithful preaching of the gospel, which has an effect on multitudes who listen to it without receiving 
it into their hearts. To hear sin exposed for what it is and holiness lifted up, to hear Christ exalted and the words of the devil denounced, to hear the kingdom of heaven and its blessedness described and the world and its emptiness exposed, to hear this week after week, Sunday after Sunday, is seldom without a good effect to the soul. It makes it far harder afterwards to run out and commit gross sins and acts as a whole. It acts as a wholesome check upon the man's heart. So Bible preaching, good preaching, not new at all, (laughs) right? We need it. You need it. I need it. Get into a healthy church or make your church better. That's number two thoughts for young men. Number one, number one, two honorable mentions. Number one. C.S. Lewis, A Life. This is a beast. 500 pages? 400. Just under 400. If you if you count all the works cited, it's over 400. Alistair McGrath, he's a scholar over in England also. Uh, great guy. Has a lot of other writings on different stuff, so I'd check him out as an author. He's not in many people's kind of sphere, kind of like Lennox. He's just over the pond, quote unquote. We like to read you know, modern new guys. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they might have a slightly different perspective on something that will help you be more robust in your theology and not cripple under the weight of some argument or something you find in scripture or some conversation you're having with an atheist or a Muslim or a Roman Catholic. Um, recommended by tons of people, Tim Keller. Eh, eh. N.T. Wright, Alan Jacobs, Michael Ward. It's all about C.S. Lewis. Uh, so there's quite a few quotes in here. Uh, goes through his life. Of course, it's a biography. Really, really helpful. It's a page turner. Uh, there's a couple, page 49. Just a brief thing, a little comment. If Napoleon was right, Lewis's world of thought and experience would have been irreparably and irreversibly shaped by war, trauma, and loss. We might, therefore, expect Lewis's inner being to be deeply mauled molded by the impact of conflict in close brushes with death. And so that's the case. So he fought in World War I, you know, so in the teens, uh, but he got off the field and because of an injury and he had another close friend die and he had another close friend. And uh, Lewis did marry, he didn't ever have any children. He did marry a, a widow. I believe she was a widow. Uh, later in life, of course, he wrote Narnia. He wrote, you know, Mere Christianity, The Great Divorce, um, a joy, a grief observed, multiple, multiple books. If you don't know Lewis, I'd really urge you. He's one of my favorites personally. Uh, Francis Schaeffer is another one. And I recommended him last time, last year. Uh, But this is a great book because it it gets into the deeper, the deeper aspects of the man, right? Because you might think you know somebody and you're like, "Eh, but do you really? Yeah, you probably don't, <laughs> right? And not not until you've at least studied or, or read a couple books on them. So McGrath, McGrath there are some pictures in here, uh, which is kind of nice. Just some black and white pictures kind of help you flesh out a little bit more. Of course, Lewis was good friends with Tolkien, or Tolkien, uh, there at uh, Oxford, and several others, including uh, Dorothy Sayers. Uh, she was part of their group too, like kind of like a writers group, the Inklings. So one thing regarding his his conversion. So he was an atheist, right? And this is where a lot of there's a lot of hope. Uh, who knows how many people were praying for C.S. Lewis? Maybe it was just one. Maybe it was none. I doubt it. It's probably at least one or two people, if not many more, because uh, he was an atheist. But there's no there's that means there's hope for your cousin, right? There's hope for your dad. There's hope for your wife, your husband, um, because well, God is bigger than our sin. Right. And he is a God who does answer prayer. But people's salvation story uh, testimony is different. Right? Not everybody says and believes the exact same thing in the exact same way and all these other stuff. 
So page 142 kind of goes through this and there's so much, I mean, you can see, and I'll, you know, I'll show you, I mean, you just look at, look at how uh, all over the place, right? So, so many books. Um, March, June, 1930, Lewis comes to believe in God. So comes to believe in God. That's it. Oh, he's a Christian. No, that's not what's making him a Christian. What he's doing, this is similar to my testimony, probably yours too. You start to have some of these walls. You know, there's these walls, these calloused scabs, these things that are barriers, right? And then they kind of get removed and they kind of dissolve and go away. But there's still something else. And there's still another hurdle. Sometimes it's just one, you know, sometimes it's 20. September 1931, so about a year later, a year and a half later, a conversion conversation with Tolkien leads Lewis to realize that Christianity is true myth. Now we get weird with that word myth. Myth is just a story. It's an account. It doesn't mean it's fiction. It's just how the word is. September uh, 28, 1931, so later in that month, Lewis comes to believe in the divinity of Christ while being driven to the Whipsnaid Zoo. Goes to the zoo. Okay. October 1, so a couple days later, 1931, Lewis tells Arthur Greaves that he has passed over from belief in God to belief in Christ. Notice that. So, oh, I believe in God. Well, the demons believe in God and shudder, right? James tells us. You know, a lot of people, oh, I believe in God, I believe in God, Whole, a higher power, spiritual, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but what about Jesus? Because God's kind of nebulous, right? God can be anything else. Now, you should certainly believe, if you're a Christian, you believe in God. But there are a lot of people who believe in God that aren't followers of God incarnate. Big difference. And then August 32. So from June 30 to August 32. So two, almost two and a half years. This is March, June, 1930. So in that springtime. To the almost fall of 1932. So two plus years. Lewis describes his intellectual journey to God in the Pilgrim's Regress written at that time in Belfast. So he's technically from Ireland, by the way, uh, but he's, he's an Englishman. He lived in England pretty much his whole life. Um, scholar, such a great, such a great testimony, such a great mind. Apologist, of course, mere Christianity. It's a little dated. There's some tweaks in there. Lewis, I think, believed in some sort of evolutionary stuff, at least at some point. I think he might've changed on that. I'm not an expert by any means, but you know, there's a few things that you're like, huh? But you have to remember when the man or woman is writing, right? Today, there's going to be people who we're going to be talking about marriage and sexuality and gender and, and abortion, all these things that nobody was arguing about 100 years ago, much less 500 years ago, right? This is the given. Of course, marriage is between a man and a woman. Of course, you don't kill your baby. Of course, you know, a nation is a good thing. A Christian nation is a good thing or whatever, right? No issue. But today we have to write these particular things. And some people are kind of mushy and they, they kind of try and defend. And this, I think, you know, in defense of Keller, though he's, you know, fairly almost indefensible. Uh, he, he's in New York City and he's trying to make the gospel relatable and the Bible relatable and this and this. OK, I kind of understand that. But, man, you're missing the mark on so many things. I'm, I've gleaned a lot. If you haven't, again, listened to John Harris's examining Keller conversation, uh, it's really, really helpful. Because he's, he's going through a book, not that he wrote a book, but he's going through a book uh, in multiple series that are posted in December and January uh, 2022, 2023. Goes through, talks about his inklings, uh, journeys, talking with Tolkien and um, Havard and uh, Grant and Hardy and several other authors and guys that were in and around there. They'd meet in a pub it's still there forgetting the name at the moment it's like the rabbit and the, the child and the rabbit or the child and the, the bird and the sparrow or the sparrow and the child baby i don't know something like that but it's a pub there in oxford because oxford of course is a town right <laughs> it's also you know houses a thousand year old university despite many statements on the contrary and popular works about lewis the narnian chronicles were never presented to the group for discussion 1950 lewis passed around proofs of the lion the witch and the wardrobe to those who had turned up to drink and chat the eagle and child there it is there it is i was close yet this was not an occasion for formal discussion or debate it was more of a case of show and tell for the work in proof not serious criticism of the work in draft that's on page 181. 
again, real, real well written. It is a page turner. Um, but if you like to take notes, you want to have something a little bit deeper, you want to read this. If you're like me, you've got a couple books going. I think I've got four, I think, going right now, four books, something like that. You know, Doug Wilson, the first number 10 said, you know, 20 books. He probably does. I can imagine he probably knows each what's going on. But do that. You know, if you're better at just sit down and plod through something over the, you know, a few days or a month, fine, do that. You know, read, read a book over a month. And you just read 12 books a year. That's, that's, that's substantial, right? Don't knock yourself because you don't read 20 books or 23 books in 2023 or 50 books a week, a book a week. Don't do that because all you're going to do is just get knocked down and drug out and no good. More on Narnia. Uh, this is page 275. The Chronicles of Narnia include criticisms of attitudes that were prevalent within the so-called progressives of Lewis's age, such as its widespread acceptance of practice of vivisection in laboratory experiments. I don't know what that is. Something bad. <laughs> Lewis had no hesitation criticizing fashionable ideas in the 1930s and 40s, such as H.E. Wells' enthusiastic advocation of eugenics and vivisection. I guess something related with eugenics, maybe abortion type related stuff, mutating people or cutting up people, mutilation rather, which would today be rejected as dehumanizing and immoral. In Lewis's 1947 essay, Vivisection, he enjoyed forces, he joined forces with the great Oxford children's novelist and 19th century Lewis Carroll. I believe that was the author who wrote um, Peter Pan. In protesting the infliction of torture on animals. For Lewis, the practice of vivisection exposed an inner contradiction within Darwinian naturalism. Now I just got to search up vivisection because it's said multiple times. I'll get the, de the definition right here. At one of the same time, it emphasized the biological proximity of animals and humans while asserting the ultimate authority of a human being to do what they please with animals. Furthermore, Lewis shrewdly noted how support for eugenics and vivisection leads to some morally uncomfortable conclusions. The eugenics theories of the 1930s, which found embarrassingly wide support in social liberal circles in Western Europe at the time, involved the assumption that certain human beings are inferior to others. Was written 80 years ago. 80 years ago. What is vivisection? What is this? Let's see here. Viv eh, monitoring laboratory animals. Britannica? Is that fairly reliable? I don't know. Let's see. Maybe it is. Vivisection. So vivisection, operation on living animals for experimental. Okay, that's kind of what I was thinking. Rather than healing purposes. More broadly, all experimentation on live animals. It is opposed by many as cruelty and supported by others on the ground that it advances medicine. Remember Tony? Anthony, another another Anthony, a very corrupt, evil man. Uh, the Beagles, right? They had like gnats or something. Like, oh my goodness. How that how that story gets so buried, it just proves that our media is so corrupt. Oh my goodness, it's so freaking evil. It's terrible. Don't listen to it. Turn off all your news, including Fox. Thanks, Britannica. So, number one, C.S. Lewis, A Life by Alistair McGrath. Fantastic book. Fantastic book. All right, honorable mention. I've not read it. Sorry, John, if you're watching this. I don't know if he watches my content. Um, I think he has a couple times, but he's busy. He's producing stuff, too. John Harris. John Harris. This is the book. Christianity and Social Justice. He wrote the other one's the blue cover. Uh, I think. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just a terrible human being. I'm a terrible friend. This is the new one. This is the newest one. Love you, John. This is a good book. He didn't tell me to do this. But I would recommend this if you have not read it yet. Religions in Conflict. Forward by Russell Muller. Russell Muller. Russell Fuller. <laughs> Russell Morler. Russell Fuller, the guy who got fired from Southern. So that's a good book I've heard. I've not read it, but I imagine it's really good. I look forward to reading it this year. And the honorable mention is The Pastor's Kid by Barnabas Piper. 
Uh, I listened to this audio uh, through Amazon. You can find it there, probably other places too. And check that out. I listened to that with my wife, kind of better understanding. It was recommended to us by a friend, Christian counselor guy. It helped us really somewhat. I mean, a lot of the stuff we're not really dealing with, but dealing with pastor's kids. So this is Barnabas Piper, of course, John Piper's son, not the uh, crazy one who does the TikTok videos and absolutely abhors and hates Christ and his family and everything about that. Uh, Abraham Piper, not him. Barnabas Piper, who stumbled and fell, and he's really honest about it. He doesn't really talk much about that in this book. It's more just the experience. He has a lot of quotes from PKs, as it were. Uh, I agree with his premise overall. I'm not a PK. I have PKs, I guess. I don't reference my children as that. I think my children don't see themselves as that. Maybe if we were in a, some big mega church and there was a lot more like kind of worldly influence, uh, maybe they'll deal with that. I don't really know. Um, it's interesting. But PKs, pastor's kid, preacher kid, for what it's worth, go read that or listen to that. It's a great book. And we'll say just as an extra, extra, extra. So 12 books, those two honorable mentions. So 10 and then 12, right? Or two. Um, in general, if you've ever heard of LibriVox, so this is Libra or Libro is book. And then Vox, of course, is voice. It's book voice or voice, voice of the book uh, is a free app. And this is books that are in the public domain. So I've listened to quite a few things. Uh, Plato, I've listened to, I don't think I'm done with it, Heretics by Chesterton. Um, listened to some things from Athanasius. Was it Athanasius? Yeah, I think it was Athanasius. And Benjamin Franklin biography, autobiography. Really, really good. Sometimes the readers, so they're all like, you could do it, honestly, guys or gals. You could read it and record it for for them you're just reading a book it has to be in the public domain um but if you're looking for something to do and you want to work on maybe your voiceover you think you have a good voice or something like that cool uh but really really helpful if you don't want to do that it's fine I'm just you can listen to it. it's all free so librivox download that app for android or apple really really cool because you can find lots and lots of stuff there's biblical contemporaries there uh galore Right. There's Karl Marx's uh, stuff and all sorts of other things. I recommend knowing about those stuff. Some people don't, you know, they really want to kind of stay in their box and stay in their lane. And I don't want to be challenged. That's fine. And I used to think like that. Um, you know, that kind of sounds weird. I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's good to be challenged and sharpened. And not just, well, evolution's wrong. Well, I know communism's wrong. I know that's wrong. I know this is wrong. It's like, well, why is it wrong? And especially if you have children, to really train them to actually deal with the challenges, the billboards, the ads, the thing that comes up, the kid at school, the teacher who wants to be called Mix or Migs or, you know, they, them or whatever. Like, how do you deal with these things? You can't just say, ah, oh, shut up. I don't know. I'm going to leave. Yeah, there is a level of just hiding and protecting, especially young minds. But to a certain point, you know, once you're in adolescence, you really need to be exposed to some of those things and see for the lies that they are. Because if you don't know that they're lies, you're going to think, well, maybe they have the truth over there. And then you're going to leave the faith, right? Or you're going to be very, very nominal or very uninfluential or very worried, a very, you know, troubled, fretting, you know, follower of Jesus. And you're always like, oh, I don't know what's going on and people and oh, this and town politics. I just wish somebody would come and save us. Well, you're not thinking rationally. You're not thinking logically. You're not thinking with a biblical worldview. So um, things like that, the Communist Manifesto and other things are out there that you can, I'm sure Darwin stuff, I haven't really read much of his stuff, but you want to know what you believe. You know, we should show ourselves approved as a workman. We're called to renew our minds. We're called to be sharpened. Uh, we're sharpening with each other. Maybe if you want to do it, then read with a fellow believer uh, or listen with a fellow believer, you know, chapter at a time, a day or a week or whatever. Hey, we're going to go through Karl Marx. What do you think? Oh, wow. This isn't just because you're reading it doesn't mean communism and Karl Marx and, and his whole crazy ideas were good. I mean, Karl Marx talking about, you know, work, for example, and he never worked a day in his life, supposedly. You know, he's writing in the posh city of London, even though he's not even English. He's German. But, oh yeah, the worker, the worker. And it's like, bro, you don't even have a job. How are you talking about a worker? Get out of here. Your crazy haircut and your wild ideas. Come on. Anyway, LibriVox. Check that out. Free. Of course, Canon 
Plus has their audiobooks. You got Amazon. You can listen to audiobooks. There's probably 400 other ways to listen to Amazon or other types of Amazon audiobooks. LibriVox, if you're like me, you're on a budget, you're broke, um, is free. Really, really like that. So that's good. You're not going to find anything new. So again, it's not new stuff. It's only things. So that's a little extra, a little cherry on top. It's just drop the cherry down like that. There we go. Hope you found this helpful, y'all. Uh, again, if you have not subscribed, please do so. Please do so. Uh, last year, like I said, I was around 200 subs. Now I'm knocking on the door of 900 into 1,000. And I know I'll get there. Uh, it's been a little slow. I have some theories why. I think part of it's just the production of content. I can't produce as much as I want to. Things always take longer. This has taken much longer. Thanks for hanging out with me, spending some time with me. Feel free to listen to this on fast. There are chapters down below of different books, the top 10 books and the other two honorable mentions. And uh, yeah, but the goal again, and kind of mentioned with the moment ago with something like Darwin or Marx to be against the world before the world, right? Darwin and Marx, they have terrible, wicked, evil ideas. And now they're dead. But there's people who believe their ideas. Well, we want to be against those ideas, not just because they're bad ideas, but for the sake of the person, for the sake of the soul, the immortal soul that is made in God's image, the person is made in God's image. We're against the world before. That's my goal for this channel is to help you do that, to help you discern that, to help you be against these things, contra mundum, pro mundo. So con against the world before it. So I hope you found this helpful. I really do. Drop a comment. Tell me what you're thinking as far as books go for 2023. If you've read some of these books, tell me that too. I'd like to like to know that. And uh, check out some of the other content as well. We'll put the 2022 video in the description also. So you can check out those books, what I recommended last year. Hope you're all well. You have a blessed day and take care. <laughs>